Check one. Yeah, it's on. Is this thing on? It's, it's going to sound great. <laughs> Attention, A-Train writers. <laughs> so, um, that's Jeff Letter, Paul Sakivi. Uh, yesterday, thank you. Um, yesterday was our 13th anniversary, uh, the, the first gig we ever played. We had done some Christmas gigs in New York, like uh, the quartet kind of versions of them at various places. Uh, do Detour one night. What was that? Internet Cafe. Mm -hmm. But then uh, a gig came up and um, I had played, it's funny, I, musicians, I can remember the first moments I've ever played with both of these gentlemen. Uh, when I first moved to New York back in 1992, um, maybe about the spring of the following year, 93, somebody called me to go out and play a rehearsal band someplace out in Brooklyn. And I remember going out there with a bass player named Dan O'Brien, who I knew from Boston. And I remember we were in some part, some part, what was that, where was that school at? Bensonhurst or something? Way, way out in Brooklyn. So we couldn't find the place. There's no GPSs or anything back then. So we stopped to some guy. We said, excuse me, sir. And, and he goes, and he goes, he did the literal, he goes, you talking to me? And we're, I'll never forget this. We said, yeah, we were looking for this high school. And he goes, oh yeah, it's right over here. He's going to end up being the nicest cat. So we're playing this, I'm playing this rehearsal band, big band. And uh, we're blowing, you know. And this cat stands up and plays tenor. I'm like, what? the hell was that man the sound just welcomed me in you know so i started playing with jeff and i played on one of the, before you started playing in my quartet we i played on one of your wise records called walking woman that was great with four trombones we do a version of um uh, uh we do a 
Cashmere. Cashmere, yeah. With, yeah. yeah, it's great. Trombone butter, all those tunes. Cameron Brown, Jamie Sapp. And then I had some gigs that I did for uh, Jazz at Lincoln Center uh, where we do, we play like uh, nursing homes around and, and, and care facilities around New York the, in the boroughs. So what I would do is hire people that were kind of in those zones because the people didn't have to travel to go there. So I know we did one in Staten Island one night. I brought a bunch of Brooklyn cats. But I was doing one at a place on the, uh, off the park on, the, on Fifth Avenue on the east side of the park bo uh, near Boys Harbor School or whatever. And um, Frank Kimbrough, the great late Frank Kimbrough, was the pianist on the date. Adam Larson, great tenor player, was playing. But, but uh, Frank said, get this kid. That I, I, mean, I love this kid from Juilliard. Get this kid to play bass, Paul, Paul Sakibi. So we, we, we play a tune. I can't remember what tune we play to start with. And after the first tune, I lean over. I said, this is, all, this is like early September. I said, what are you doing in August <laughs> or in October? I said, I got, this, I got this trip out west with the quartet and Chris Lightcap can't make it. I think he'd be really great for it. He goes, yeah, sure. It started literally after the first two. So that's why I tell my students all the time. It's like, what we want to do is be ready for music. You know, we want to be ready for music. This is, we're playing songs. That's what I want to do. I want to play songs really well. So these guys play songs so brilliantly. And I think one of the things that I've been finding in the last couple of years as a musician and I think we have to exhibit this too. We, all we do, we really want, what we, what we really, really are concerned about is, is expressing ourselves, offering and receiving. But on the bandstand, we want to feel that we're being felt and heard by everybody. And sometimes this instrument <clears throat> gets a little, you know, gets a little neglected, you know, it's like, you know, unfortunately. And a lot of it may be brought on by us at times. We have to like, you know, we have to know the songs, we have to know the harmony, we have to, you know, we have to know all the aspects of the music, if, if, if not the same as the horn players and the rest of the rhythm section and all that, if not, if not as much, more. And I'm proud to say that with a lot of my students, they, they know the tunes and they, they know the harmonic rhythm and stuff of going on, what's going on, they can sing it better than some of the guitar players and horn players that do this stuff. So, in that defense, but being felt and heard. In that simple thing, like that respect of like, wow. And that's how we can get up here and share things. That's what we're doing to me. I'm sharing sound, you know. There's a few words that I have moved out from my thing. And one of them is keep time. You know, I don't keep time, man. We share it. We want to share it. I'm keeping them over here like this, right? But these guys share it so beautifully. And when you, when you, when you give it that aspect of sharing, then it just feels so much organic and feels so much more organic and feels alive to me. It feels alive. We start out every season without having played all year, and we play those first two B-flats of this tune, and we know we're off. And like every year, we're like, I can't believe we're doing this again. <laughs> but every time we play, it, it just gets, it, 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 we find something new every time. And some of it's because we, we keep some of these structures, but then there's a lot of freedom within the structures at times, too. And we take a lot of, it gives, affords us then to be allowed and to be welcome to take a lot of chances. But I love these, these, these two gentlemen, and I'm very blessed, knock on bird's eye maple craviato, thank you, Johnny, um, that I'm around musicians that do really give up that feel of, 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 of hearing and respect. I've been really fortunate. I mean, what a gift I've been given to be around these kind of musicians. One of which was the great Walter Dewey Redmond, who I played with from uh, uh, 19... Uh, or, or, or let's see what year I started with him in 1994 until he passed uh, 19, two, he died September 2nd, 2006. I was playing the Chicago Jazz Festival the day, the day after he died. I was with him the day he died. And uh, he was one of those kind of people, man, that allowed you. Matter of fact, one, matter of fact, one time we played a concert in Europe and he said, uh, he, he was very, always very gracious. One of the most gracious people that I've ever had a chance to perform with. And he would always say, Thank everybody for your music. Thank, Matthew, thank you for your music. He always called me Matthew. And these saxophone players all call me Matthew because Dewey called me Matthew. So he'd say, uh, he said, uh, Matthew, you know, people sound their best when they play with me. And I was like, wow. I'd never heard an utterance of ego ever emerge from this gentleman's mouth, ever. And I, thought, I started thinking about this when I was through a pizza. I was like, wow, really? And then I started to realize that he was right. That I, People sound their best when they play with him because he allowed you to, to, to do that. So that's really what I want to do as a musician. So what do we do to get to that, right? Well, 
we have to know our instrument too, right? We have to, we have, to have such a, a relationship, our personal relationship with the instrument is key. Our personal blend, our personal sonic choices, our, the way we move, the way we hear the music with the drums, the way we hear the music, the way we hear the drum, all of it. And I think if we start to feel this way, then uh, we, we hear where we are in the music a lot of times too that way. So I, I, I love, one of my, my favorite thing is just that blend, you know, and I'm, again, very blessed to get to do a lot of different kinds of situations, and, you know, and I don't put anything above the other, you know. I, I love the American Songbook. I love music that has no time. I like noise music. I like, you know, I love playing with singers. And, and to me, it all feeds my soul because if I only do one thing, or have a preference. I don't really. I really don't have a preference. You know. I. I. I just love every opportunity. So I, you know, Monday night I made a really cool record for the former student of mine, from the new school. Great bassist. You know. Last week I did. A, you know. We. We were out. Right before that I made a. Last week I also made a record with a, a, a really great pianist who's also a podiatrist. <laughs> the record's called Feet First. It's kind of a cool name, right? He's bad man. He's like an older guy. Just retired as a podiatrist. But man, I had a touch and a feel and a spirit, man, that I loved. So that was Martin Wind, Michael Rodriguez, Matt Moran. So it was a fun date, you know? So all these different situations all the time, you know? But you still want to bring, you know, your sound, your personality to it. But at the same time, you know? So I heard this great story recently from the great Billy Hart. And uh, we, we had a drummer hang during the pandemic every Tuesday. Rich Thompson would organize it. But sorry to... Started out with most you know, like teachers, but then the you know players, teachers. And so, but but man, and, and then the first couple of weeks, it started it would go to late and later and later. Finally, we had a, it was nine to eleven every, every Tuesday, and and my girlfriend, she just knew that Tuesday nights that was it. You know, it was the drummer hang we got. So Rich Thompson organized, that, Carl Allen, Kenny Washington was on every time. You know, like just the records I wrote down every week from Matt Nussbaum. John Riley, Bill Goodwin, just to get it, you know, Roy McCurdy came on one night, Lewis Hayes was on one night, um, Harold Jones would come on quite often, Billy Hart was on, uh, Tane came on, it was, it was fantastic, we did this fellowship, you know, but Billy Hart told the story, he was in D.C. as a kid, younger person, and, he, and went to hear John Coltrane, and Elvin Jones was 45 minutes late for the set, which was not, you know, Elvin had things going on, so he was a little late, and, and John Coltrane said to him, he said, you know, you know what, Billy? You know what I love about John, what I love about Elvin Jones? You think, okay, the power, the big sound. He goes, his professionalism. <laughs> <laughs> and he wasn't being sarcastic. He wasn't being, you know, if you listen to Elvin Jones, he always played the gig. He played the music amazingly. You know, if you listen, to, if you think about the one week that they recorded live at Birdland, the Johnny Hartman record, and then the record that came out just a few years ago. They did that all in one week. And the way he plays on those records are masterful. The, the Johnny Hartman record alone is a study of just great orchestration, great musical playing. So, I mean, you know, we gotta, what I tell the students all the time, it's easy to take the cupcake and take the frosting off. But when you peel back that paper and get into the cake of what all these great masters have done, then you're really getting into something, right? So, you, you, you study those things, you study the aspects. I love this, there's this other record that he plays on of, of his brothers. We've, we've listened to it in the car one time. It's with, uh, I think it's Kenny Burrell and Milt Hinton, and they do some tunes from a musical. And they play, the, you know this record, uh, Eric? I can't remember, it's some tunes from a musical, but he plays this bossa nova that is just so great, it's like, uh, Like it's the way Elvin would do it, and uh, it's just so beautiful. And I, you know, I got to be, I was in the studio with Elvin once. I, I, I went to a record date of Elvin's. So it's, it's a record called It Don't Mean a Thing. If, it Don't Mean a Thing. It's on Inja Records. And so I was playing in Cecil McBee's band at the time, so it was a date at Systems 2. So he invited me, and so I was in this all day with, with uh, the master in the studio. And, and he, it was great. Just after, I mean, his focus on every take. Was, was amazing. It was Nicholas Payton, uh, Ravi Coltrane. No, it was, no, Sonny Fortune, Nicholas, Delphio, Willie Pickens, great Chicago master, and McBee. And man, it was fantastic to be there. 
So I got to kind of, you know, I, even before that, I knew him a little bit, you know. But, and then, um, but I just absorbed, like, what I felt like is, what I always took away more was, like, listening to how they approach orchestrating things. And one of my favorite records for him is the John Coltrane record called Coltrane. And I just love the way the cymbal sounds and the way he blends on that and everything. So I'm always going, I've, I've always gone, you know, for that. And I watched him a lot too. You know, I just would go and watch him play. And the last time I saw him play, I was in, I was in Spain. Andrew Hill and John Abair and I went to see Elvin and our view was kind of, the stage was up and our view was side stage and we saw this. We saw this. And I looked at John Abair and I said, you know what? Not a lot of things in life are perfect. That's perfect. One night, Martin Wind and I, the great bassist, we went to see uh, Jack DeJanette at Birdland. And we were at the bar on the other side of the bar. We had a view about this far between bottles and heads. And that view was this. Jack playing the ride cymbal. The whole night. That's when we can we can hear, but just watching him play the cymbal. And I said to Marty, I said, "Man, I said we don't only have the we don't only have the best seat in Berlin. We got the best seat of anybody doing anything tonight in New York. You know, just to watch the artistry of, of Mr. Dijonet addressing the cymbal, just the way he addressed the cymbal. And I asked him about it once. I hung out with Mr. Dijonet quite a bit at his house and everything like that. One time we were at the Detroit Jazz Festival." And I, and I said to him, I said, this, the, just the energy you have right around here is unbelievable. His energy here is unbelievable. He's like, yeah, yeah. He's like, talking about it. And, he, and, and the people are coming in. It's like, I'm helping him set up this uh, Alice Coltrane tribute. And uh, Robbie did with, Brand, with Brandy Younger. And Charlie was playing bass, Hayden. And, uh, and Jack goes, yeah, yeah. And, one, and, uh, and, and, and Jack said, yeah. And he showed me. And he, he went like this. He went. And everybody just stopped. The whole place, the people getting their seats in the amphitheater at the Detroit Festival, they just all stopped. It was like one of those old like, National Geographic shows, you know, where something makes a sound and all the birds leave the trees and the elephants start going, Rawr! and the hippos come up out of the water. And he just unleashed nature with one stroke on the drum. He just went. I was like, damn. The power. The... And it wasn't loud. It was just like, it said something, though. So uh, I, I remind him about that all the time. He's always, he always laughs at that. But it was great, you know, just to, to feel that, you know. So I, I've been very lucky, very blessed to be uh, not only play with great musicians, but see great musicians. And that's what you've got to do. You've got to, like, you've got to, like, dive in and, 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 Find the ways, you know, that, to, to, to help you get to the music you want. Chick Corea talks about to find, to find techniques that serve your imagination. Create techniques that serve your imagination. So, it's, it's, you know, sometimes we want to, we're so concerned about what's right or wrong. Everything's cool. The answer is yes to me. If it's legal, you know, it's not. The answer is yes, so try it, you know. And one of my favorite things, we, we, I just got these guys these t-shirts that say, uh, that's a horrible idea, what time? And that's kind of how I live because, because Jeff is one of my, you know, he's in a lot of, we collaborate a lot with a lot of things. And he's one of those kind of guys that I'll, you know, I'll have that third cup of coffee and call him up. Hey, man, we got to do this. We got to try it. And, all, and most of the things that we've schemed up come to fruition in some sort. You know, so even if, if only a third of them come to fruition, at least we thought of them when we're trying to do something. You know, and it's been a really great experience to not only, you know, but have people that help you follow through with these ideas that trust you enough or not <laughs> in certain cases like one day in, in portugal in portugal yeah and one day in the studio making the uh uh honey and salt record you guys were all questioning me about the one thing even matt balanceris was like how what are you gonna do here i'm like it's all gonna work out yeah. it's all gonna be cool yeah. so you know i think what i tell people is find people that help you with your mechanics of the instrument and find people to help you with your imagination find people it may not even be a, a person that plays your instrument you may f come across you know Somebody that, that will turn you on to things all the time. You know, that's why you got to make yourself available to whatever is happening. And so you never know when you be on something and somebody can change your life. One of my sayings is when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. So you never know when you get to some place 
And somebody may turn around and go, hey, have you heard this before? Or, or check this, you know, are you? And you're like, oh, all of a sudden your life is completely changed by some direction that someone gave you. Or in that case too, a lot of times for me, luckily, giving permission to try things. So I was very lucky. And I, I feel very fortunate in that, that um, what, I had a, a, a great family. You know, my, my parents were very cool, brought me to all these drum workshops and stuff. And my brother was, my middle brother played saxophone. These guys knew him passed away five years ago, but um, uh, he, he got me a record set when I was a kid called The Drums. It was a, a um, ABC Impulse would put out, they put out these box sets of three records. They did one for the bass. We got you one in St. Louis, mm -hmm. right? There's one on the saxophone, there's one. And they, they, they were in the archives of, of ABC or Impulse Records, you know? So on this they had, it, it went at this point, when I was 13 or so, it went from Baby Dodds to uh, Barry Allshul, that uh, and motion on, on this side. So it had Danny Richmond on it, it had Sonny Murray playing Ghost with Albert Eiler, it had uh, Beaver Harris playing with Archie Shep, it had Danny Richmond, it had Richard Davis and Elvin playing Shiny Stockings off of, of uh, quiet, uh, uh, Heavy Sounds, you know, all these records. So I just thought that that's what a jazz drummer did, all that from Baby Dodds to to Barry Allschultz or to Sonny Murray. I just thought, you know, I didn't know I had to sign up for a five-year period, you know, which is kind of, sorry, but that's kind of what sometimes happens, right? You know, like, well, you know, jazz only really happened between these years. But I mean, you know, this, to me, it's ancient to the future. I mean, there's a lot of legacies. There's a lot of traditions. There's not just, you know, the 50s or into the 60s. There's a lot of traditions, right? So I was very fortunate to, 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 to sort of be an idiot or naive enough to just take it all in. And I still like to be an idiot, but I <laughs> make my living that way. But, a, um, but that kind of like interest in all that too made a real difference. So I, I, that's what I feel like, it, it, you know, the thing, also I had some great teachers. You know, I, 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 I had a great teacher as a kid. I started playing with my brother actually early on. We, I had a snare drum, I, I still have it. I bought it from Steve Jackson. Uh, it was an orange sparkle. Uh, some sort of Japanese drum with a little cymbal. And my brother and I would play saxophone and drum duets. We'd, pro we'd go to town, we live in the country, we'd go to town on the weekends and go to Byerly Music in Galesburg and buy sheet music and then, or books like Hits of 73. And we'd play all these songs. And we'd play for 4-H meetings, PTA meetings, my mom's women's club meetings. We'd do a little, and we did comedy. And it does, nothing changes, you know, it's all the same. But, and it was fun to do that. So I didn't really, I, I learned on my own and then uh, uh, John, John Larson, Adam Larson's father, was a teacher of mine. Gave me some really musical things and, and, and learned to read and, and, and all that kind of thing and theory. And I played vibraphone and tipping and all that stuff too, which is what I majored in college. But I've been fortunate. And then in, in 1984, I got a, a National Endowment grant, a jazz, a jazz apprenticeship grant to study with the great Ed Sof. And that was really pivotal for me, especially when I was 19 years old, to have somebody like that... Um, really guide me in stroke and relaxation and movement, you know, along with everything, sound and, 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 and coordination and independence, and all that kind of stuff, or however you want to refer to it. The same summer I did, a, I, I attended a great workshop of, of Bob Moses, and that was a really uh, a life changer for me. And the same summer I saw Elvin and Philly Joe in the same night in New York City. My, the first building I was ever in in New York City was the Village Van Guy. And I was just there last week to see uh, Christian McBride's band. And I told my girlfriend and her sister, I said, this is the first building I was ever in in New York City. It was right down here to see Elvin Jones. And the next night I saw Elvin there and I went to Lush Life and saw Philly Joe Jones with Dan Maroney. Man, when I saw Philly, Joe, Joe Jones, it looked like the sticks were flexible. It looked like they were wavy. It was just like, you know. Uh, Richard, uh, no, uh, Charles Davis, Don Sickler, Larry Ridley, Mulgrew, Johnny Griffin was in that Dan Maroney band. I have a photograph, somebody took a photograph of that week in 1984 and I bought it from Brian McMillan in California, he was there. So it's wild, I was there, you know, maybe not that night, but I you know, experienced it. And I was at the bar, I was sitting at the bar and Philly Joe Jones came up right, like, right where my China symbol is and, and ordered a cognac in Bella Lugosi's voice like he does on Blues for Dracula. And I was like, this is the greatest thing ever. I, I was, back then we didn't have email or, or, or wrote postcards. I, I heard Philly Joe and he did Bella, he did the Dracula voice 
right there in front of me, you know? If you guys don't know, there's a great record on Riverside Records called Blues for Dracula. It has him on the cover. And um, he does this tune and he, he, he does a whole Bella Lugosi thing. You know, it's like, um, bite, bite your mom, good night, you know? <laughs> Drink your soup before the class. I am the wee wop vampire. I like to make the song sound good. So I know I heard him. And then, but, but I, I heard him first on a recording uh, two, two of my favorite jazz records of all time is probably, if I would go to the Desert Island and somebody said, what, do you, what would you bring? It would be working and steaming. Because I got them in a twofer and I listened to those over and over again. And I looked at the picture. We didn't have the video back in the day. So I watched the picture. There was a picture of him in the inside cover of this reissue, Prestige, of the way he was just addressing the symbol. And I thought, okay, well, if that's how he does it, that's how I'm going to try to do it because I saw the picture. And I love the sound. I love that I could see in the record store in Minneapolis, I could see the stick tip hit the symbol while I was in the store. And so this symbol, this, both of these are kind of influenced by that, for me, my ears of that sound. You know on that record where you go, when they play Surrey with the French on top and it goes to John Coltrane solo, the sound of that symbol on that tune. And then, we, we did, I did a little bit in this first tune, but if you listen to those recordings really closely, Billy Joe Jones orchestrates the time very similarly for when he accompanies each of those great artists. So with, with, with Miles Davis, he plays a, what I call carpet grooves a lot, something like cross stick. So you play like. With John Coltrane, he comped. So you, you hear him play more here than If you listen really closely with Red Garland, he feathers the snare drum. So you hear on those records, you hear like the reinforcement of the, of the quarter note of the ride and the bass drum on the snare drum. And I think he used the butt end of the stick because it's thicker. So you hear this. Everything comes from somewhere. <laughs> I can pretty much, I can pretty much say, wow, well, I heard this person do this, I saw it, you know? And that's really a lot of that, a lot of my story. The, uh, another great artist I want to mention, just as far as, Roy Haynes lives in my town, so, you know, I kind of have a thing for, him, for Roy Haynes, but I had a thing for Roy Haynes before he, I knew we lived in the same town. It's, it's wild to see Roy Haynes, back before the pandemic, I'd see him in the grocery store. <laughs> that's a man. I mean, I, would, I wrote down everything he bought. I figured, you know, grapefruit juice, soy milk, I saw everything. One day we're in the store and he leaves before I do. You know how grocery stores all have big windows. He's walking by. And I said, I, I just, just had, to, had to do it. I, just, I said, folks, see that gentleman right there? That's the world's greatest living drummer, that gentleman right there. And so the, the, the guy that was checking me out goes, uh, well, we knew he was something. And I said, oh, he's something, all right. So it's been great to like see him go over to his house. You know, we were over there after one of, after one of his birthdays recently, you know, like in 19. And uh, wild, man, just like, you know, it's crazy to think that these people, you know, you're around them and you're like, you know, like it's the, the stories. But a gentleman I want to bring up for that too, for me, was Louis Belson. The great Mr. Belson was awesome. And I learned a lot about music. I learned about how to be. I, I, one of the reasons I started composing and stuff is because I interrupted, I didn't interrupt him, but I was at a jazz camp when I was a kid at Western Illinois University on a Saturday morning, and he was in the, this band room at the piano with a score paper writing. I said, oh, I, oh I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry, sorry to mean interrupt. He goes, no, come on, sit over here. I'm working on this. He shows me how he's voicing this saxophone solely and, and he, and he was super cool. But the sound he got from the drum, right? Just the, and his motion sound, the way he moved, the, the sound through the motion was great. So I, I was, was really, always really drawn to the sound he got out of the snare drum, especially, and the efficiency of motion. So he's one that told me as a kid, he said, take an old pair of sticks to the pool and let your air out and go to the bottom and do your stroke in the water because your hand will travel the path of least resistance. So when I did this one exercise with Soph called the Relaxed Stick Lift, it all came from that, really. We just opened up all these hinges this way. So I do this still a lot. I still do a lot of stuff with movement. I still do a lot of stuff with opening up the stroke 
and I'm finding new ways of playing the stroke like all the time. You know, I'm still really, you know, uh, uh, interested in, in the ways of playing. I think what we want to do is we want to have ways. If you, you don't want to have a way, you want, you know, like Jeff doesn't have a sound, he has sounds. Paul, you know, Paul has sounds, he gets a lot of sounds. And the, that way then you can play to the music and, and, we're, and nobody is resistant free, nobody is limitation free. Matter of fact, we're defined by our limitations as much as we are by our strengths. So we have to figure out what to do. Field expedience, my father used to say. So, so like you figure out ways to play. And so, but the loose part for me was, was really great. And then Jeff Hamilton is a good friend of mine too and he was very, very uh, helpful with that. Andrew Surreal, I took one lesson with in it and it really changed me in a lot of ways. I don't really remember what we talked about, just about sound and everything, but he's one of the people that really encouraged me to move to New York. I was in Boston at that time. My, my late wife was doing her master's at New England Conservatory. And so I took a lesson with Mr. Surreal and it was, and we're still really close, you know. We just, every time we see, we just crack up at the new school. It's wild to see him too there. You know, it's like, man, so I always blame him. You're the, I'm bad in this town, you know. So that's a little bit of just upbringing. I went to Wichita State University. I studied with a great guy named J.C. Combs there. He didn't really, he just, these guys all know Dr. Combs and, and uh, you know, he's just, if not one of the, if not the most imaginative, most creative person I've ever been around and many for a lot of us. And we did all these crazy pieces. We did a concerto for, uh, called War Games by a composer who just passed named Walter Mays. It was a concerto for professional wrestlers and percussion. And yeah, I dropped it too. Um, so yeah, so I, I was always in a lot of worlds of, 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 of theater, presentation, the whole thing. Thus, why we do all this? Because, you know, everybody in jazz sometimes is like, well, you know, no, we can, we can, we can, we can, we can, we can it's not a bad word to entertain. Matter of fact, if you're a gracious host, you're an entertainer, right? If you have someone in your house, you're entertaining them. So I feel like if we, if we do that through the music, then that way we can do this and we can try something like Emmanuel, which is not normal or whatever, as normal, and, and still reach people you know, by, by connecting with them by, the, again, this offering and receiving aspect of the music. So, any questions about stuff? Or yeah, Matt, I was yeah. going to say maybe we should take some questions. Yeah. yeah. I feel so official now. Oh, yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, I have lots of musical inadequacies I could ask you about. But I remember you mentioned, like, knowing the whole tune. Um, and um, I love how you talked about learning like the harmonic rhythm, things like that. And I noticed um, during actually both your solos, um, you know, you really played very close to the melody. It was extremely easy to hear the melody in your solo. Um, so Thank my you. question is, you know, over the years I've gotten better at uh, soloing over the form, um, you know, um, but then we, I think a lot of things we are taught to sing the melody in our head as we solo. Um, but I always like to have some sort of backup plan. Um, so like, let's say if you're playing a solo and then all of a sudden, um, for whatever reason you lose the melody or you hold a whole note one measure too long or, you know, cause how would you handle that? Like getting back out of the solo cleanly or, you know, cause we all have gaps in concentration or something like that. And I found as a musician, if you only have one way of approaching something, it's, I mean, you, you, you always need to have a backup plan because, you know, life happens, right? Mm -hmm. So how would you approach that situation? Well, first of all, I like accompaniment. So then that, but, but, um, but really for me, we're playing by ourselves. So we do have a certain amount of freedom. There's a, a colleague of mine, who, we were a student that I teach at one of the schools I teach at San Francisco Conservatory, one of my drums, just quite a few years ago, was, was playing solo and, um, and, and, and maybe one person came in, you know. And he said, we have to count during the drum solo. I'm like, I raised my hand, I said, you know, I have to, I kind of have to disagree with you there, my friend. I said, I, said, I think you have to, we have to hear them, we have to listen to them. If you're paying attention, you know, we're going to hear. Am I counting during Jeff solo? That's the last thing I'm going to do. I'm listening. I'm checking it out. I'm not counting. You know, so we're by ourselves. So we do have this certain amount of freedom. Um, I always, I think of the tune as the, it's in the passenger seat all the time. You know, if I turn left, I turn right. That pat, the tune's still over there, hopefully. <laughs> you know, so, um, and that all started from a lady in Galesburg named Marge Fanning. I, I took you by, I 
Washington. Jeff knows all these yeah. sites. So I, 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 told, I said, this was a nursing home. I was playing a gig, an MPTF gig back in the day. The Musicians Performance Trust Fund where they hire you to play this little place. Thing thing I was doing for like Jazz Lane in the center. And so I was like pumped to do this, a drum solo on something. I was like, Miss Vanner, I want to play a drum solo. She's like, so we were playing Sweet Georgia Brown. So I just went like <laughs> Maybe not quite that over the top, but a little bit, you know? Because I was like seeing the cats, like, you know, counting them back in. I come in. She pulled me aside. She said, um, can I talk to you? I said, yeah. She goes, what the hell were you doing over there? I said, I was, I was playing my solo. She goes, hmm. Hmm. Well, when I did play mine, I was playing Sweet Georgia Brown. And when Jim Huff, the trumpet player, I can still remember these names. When he was playing, he was playing Sweet Georgia Brown and Don Betts, who would play electric bass and smoke those brown cigarettes back in the 70s. Um, he, was, he, he played Sweet Georgia Brown. I, I don't know what the hell you were doing. That was the first time I, I didn't realize we were supposed to play the form. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I was 13 or 14 years old. I, I, but I'm glad somebody told me that then, because then I, got, I became very aware of it. And then there's a great record called Rich vs. Roach on uh, MRC Records. Uh, Jimmy Cobb was actually at the date, he told me, because we talked together, and Julian Priester, who's still with us, he's like the only surviving person, I think, that was at, there. He was in Max's band at that point. G.G. Grice did the arrangements. So they play Sing, 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 the great Louis Prima, made famous by uh, Benny Goodman, right? So Buddy plays this, the first solo. It's, you know, like blare through, you know, it's amazing. But then Mr. Roach plays with bass accompaniment. Plays the form. I didn't know it was the form, mm -hmm. but I was sitting, listening with Jay Litchfield. He was a buddy of mine. Summertime's hot as hell downstate. You know, we just uh, the only thing to do is stay inside and, and then look out the window and watch the corn grow. But um, <laughs> but we were listening to records, and so he had this record, and it changed my life right there. It's one of those life-changing moments where I heard Mr. Roach really sing on the instrument. And it's ba dum gum 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 gum. <laughs> Does, it's, he really plays phrases and themes mm -hmm. and really sings on the instrument. And I was like, that's what I want to do. <laughs> and so then I became, you know, I got pretty enamored with, with Mr. Roach. Matter of fact, one of my, I have triplet sons, they're 21 years old now, but one of them, his name is Max. I wonder why. <laughs> so I, I, love, I, I love the artistry of him. So for me, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I have backup plans. I mean, we have things that we do, you know, but I, I just, you know, one of the things I, 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 I instill in young musicians is, I think one of the things that's gonna make you more valuable in general is focus. I think focus is one of the, I mean, it's not, it's not young, it's not, it's, I don't want to, I'm not, it's not generational. It's not, I don't want to, it's not like younger people don't have focus, it's not that. It's societal, you know, that we just don't have that focus. But there are some people that are really, really focused musicians, you know, like, but, you know, they play and man, you know, they know what's going on like the whole time on the bandstand. Joe Lovano, you know, man, he knows everything that's going on on the bandstand. Terrell Stafford, Jeff, these cast, these are a bunch of people I want to surround myself with. So they'll, if they're hearing you, if they're feeling and hearing you, they're going to go with those things and they don't need, you know. So I had a, I had a jury, a drum students do some jury, I hate that word, assessment today, I call them. And he, and he, and he blew on rhythm changes and he kept the hi-hat going. I said, why are you keeping the hi-hat going, Miles? He says, well, to help my, my time and also to help make it clear for everybody else to know where, where I am. I said, you, sh you should be able to know where you are by your themes. Mm -hmm. So when he played a solo without it, it was actually, to me, a lot better because the, the themes followed through. You know, I, I think about themes all the time. I want to think about the idea to the very end. I think about weights of things, I think about the ideas, I think of you know, all the shifts of things. But for me, the follow through of the idea, and a lot of that comes because we don't deal with duration all that much. Because when we started in band, they played the B flat, ba. Am I there? 
What? Ba. Yeah, close. <laughs> Sorry. And we went, what? They played a whole note and we went two, three, four. So duration, what is this? It's what we want it to be, right? It, it can be, so I think intent has a lot to do with it. So for comping, for example, one of the first things I have students do for comping is comp with whole notes. Way the ideas do this they're not so to the measure and it creates and 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 singable melodies are made up of those note values values when, when it, if i'm going to teach or sing somebody i remember you i don't go i remember you two three four you're the one three that make my dreams come true we, we go i remember you you're the one that made my dreams come true a few kisses ago, right? So we want to we want to have that feeling in it. I saw when I saw Mel Lewis one one time. He he, he did this thing. He he did this. Well, first of all, a couple of things. He changed my life too. He he, he was at a, he was a special. He was a guest at this event, All Star, and uh, and uh, and they all went around and played a thing. And he said, uh, "I'm going to play uh, Body and Soul." He did a whole, he did an intro. It was like.
So thank you. So he, thank you. So I, you know, that's the other thing is we, we you know, we feel like that everything has to be the, the when there's a drum solo, it's always on the songs. They're like, but but slow blueses, whatever. Like I, I, Dewey was great, man. I blew, blew on all the ballads with him all the time. You like playing the ballads, don't you, Matthew? I'm like, yeah, I love them, man. Because you get this, this the freedom of expression within there. But th that day, Mr. Lewis did did a thing where he 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 dropped a stick. He was like. He said he was doing a record date one time. He dropped his thing. He just said, well, you couldn't stop. He says, I just made it part. So that's a mistake, right? Most people go like, oh, my gosh. People, you know, and he just made it something. So there again, that's when, that's when something like that creates a new opportunity. So I think if we're not judging it, if we're hearing what we're playing but not judging it, which is easy to say... Believe me, and not that simple to do, but, but let, like, and, and if we react, you know, if we react, it's kind of like, I tell my students, I had a saxophone player that stays with me, uh, Will Brown, great, great young tenor player, and he's fantastic, and, 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 and one of the things he would do is he'd play something, and he would, if he didn't dig it, he'd go, ugh. I said, don't do that, man. I said, that's like the old Star, the old Star Trek. You'd be, they'd be on the, what do they call, what they call the area where they, Felicia was a Trek, yeah, I was Batman, but, uh, where they, the deck, or what they call it, the, where they, the, no, where they ran the, the shape, the, the enterprise, what they call it, the bridge, yeah, the bridge. You know, when they get hit by something, they had to overdo, to get, show that they were getting hit, they overdo and roll all over the place. That's what, that's what I feel like when you make a mistake and you that, you're just, sh you're just taking yourself away from the music. So if you play through it, like, okay, you know, all right, it's cool, you know. Like, just keep, keep, got to keep the, the, the forward motion moving all the time. So I feel like if the tune just keeps rolling by, you, you'll find it. And, and you know, it, 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 again, it's, we're, we're playing music. You know, it's not like, you're not like that surgeon that <laughs> goes, oops, <laughs> that's not cool. But, you know, we're us, we're, you know, it's pretty, not very dangerous in a lot of ways, right? So if we make a mistake in this, it's, it's not the end of the world. You know, the sun's, the sun's still going to come up. Well, not around here lately. The sun hasn't been out for a while. But, you know, luckily, you know, the trees will still be there and all that, too. So we're, we just allow those things to take us places, you know. And I think if we do that in the music, too, it's, it's cool. Like, wow, just go with, what, with what's happening, you know. And for our ears are opened up. And I think a lot of that is being relaxed. If you're relaxed, then you can go with things. If you're like this at any given time, I can tell when Sue's, you know, myself too, I can tell them, like, uh-oh, when you do this, that means it takes you away for a second. But if I keep everything loose, you know, then, then I can go with those changes, those different things a lot more. So, good question, though. I could go on and on about that one. You should ask these cats, too, about questions about playing stuff. But anybody have questions more about drums aspect of things? Should we play another tune? Yeah. Let's play two. Let's play, uh, let's play, uh, um, let's play uh, the... Uh, Pastelas, let's do that. Yeah. You want to talk about it, Jeff? Jeff's our resident, one of our resident uh, musicologists. Take it over, Jeff Letterer. All right, thanks. Um, yeah, so we have songs from various traditions in our holiday repertoire in this group. <laughs> so one of the songs I brought in is an example of an aguinaldo, which is a traditional song from Puerto Rico. It's played as part of a tradition of paranda, going from house to house. and um, But just because it's kind of a drum-centric thing, when I brought it in, you know, one of the great things about playing with Matt is, and I'm gifted to play with incredible drummers in my life, you know, um, Allison Miller and Bobby Sanabria and Matt, and it's just amazing. But if I bring in this Puerto Rican tune, it's an example of a bomba. It's like bomba plena rhythm, but I certainly don't want to say that to Matt because he just, like he was talking about, he just play, he plays the song. He doesn't, he doesn't, he plays the song. So this one is an aguinaldo, and it's called Si Me Dan Pasteles, and it is a bomba plena. That's where it's I a bomba. I the lyric. Uh, okay. Oh. Uh, uh, well, it's like a drum clinic, so, but. No, it's good. They got All right, the, word, the words of the things. song. Uh, si Me Dan Pasteles, Deme Los Calientes, Pa Pasteles Fríos, Empachan La Gente, which means, if you give me pasteles, which are these little pastries, they're like hard to describe, they're made of yuca flour, and they're filled with either meat or other stuff, and um, they're a holiday tradition. 
Uh, and the lyric says, if you give me pastels when I'm doing the paranda, singing my aguinaldo, going from house to house, give it to me hot, because if you give me a cold pasteles, it's going to make me sick. <laughs> make me hungry.
Thank you. Thank you. So you know, it's 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 really fun to have um, moods and and all these different things to explore too within a evening of music. And that's something I I learned a lot from from uh, great band leaders that I've worked for: Dewey, Charlie Hayden, you know, um, Lee Konitz, Charlie Cole Hayes from Boston. Who was a, he's a great band leader. Like a, the array of material that we can do within a a, a, a evening of music to try different things. So it's kind of, you know, th that gives that tune, this, 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 this drum, that, the, the beads on there, kind of gives this, uh, me a, a limitation, yet but the, the, in, in turn yields a lot of results because, you know, each time I try to find something new and we do something like that, that's great. <laughs> I, I didn't know what to expect out of that. I didn't know that drum. But. Yeah, well, yeah, he doesn't know that drum. He's, he's got a good feel on it. No, but... Uh, <laughs> And it's that sense of adventure, you know, of of uh, of, of welcoming new, welcoming things, you know, and but everybody's really again that focus of hearing and and and, and hearing the shapes and everything. It's 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 really really fun. So you know, um, the music is really what you know. I I like the mu I like songs. You know, I like to write songs. I like to have those songs played. I like to place. You know. Songs and for me anymore, it's kind of I approach a lot of this stuff more maybe from from a, even more from a pop drummer's perspective about how much I can play, um, how much I can serve the music without having to do very much. I played on the, on this date that I did the other night. We did this tune called Little Birdie, which is a Vince Guaraldi kind of a funk tune. I think Tom Harrell arranged it for the record originally, and I stayed on the hi hat. I never crashed a cymbal the whole track. I just stayed on this like. I didn't play any kicks with it or any, I, it just felt, you know, better, you know. Sometimes too, we feel like we've got to do something all the time. There's this case of this tune on, a, on the Liberation Music Orchestra record where um, Carla Blay wrote this great drone, this great vamp drone that repeats over and over again. And I, I played bass drum on one and this China cymbal on two, three. I went, and Chris Cheek, the great tennis, saxophone just paints over this whole vibe so when i when the first day we recorded it i thought oh i better build it so after a while i, I better I maybe i'll put hi-hat splash with the one on the bass drum so I, and I thought i better double with the snare after a while i, better, I gotta do something i gotta build it i got and it sounded stupid <laughs> so from that point on, whenever we played that tune, I would get in, I would just get into a trance and play one, two, three, it probably was for 10, 11 minutes. And that's, I never changed it. I went. And after a while, I was hearing the drum, the bass drum sound like the front head and the bass drum be part of the pitch and the, 
the cymbal be part of the chord. And man, it was just like I, I allowed the sounds to go places. I didn't feel like I had to do something at that point. You know, so it was, it was a real education. I'm glad we got to do it again. And I didn't say, they, nobody said anything. I heard it and I was like, boy, I'm dumb. Like, I feel like, all right, I better do something here. I better, you know, been doing, not doing anything is the best thing. <laughs> you know, so, so, so sometimes, so that's why too, I don't, I don't, I, like a lot of times, a lot of certain like tempos, I don't, I'm not a big cymbal beat, uh, cymbal melody changer. I pretty much don't, I mean, it's not dogmatic, but if it's medium, I don't really change it. I keep it going. One less thing for people to have to think about. But if it, if it feels like it's interrupting something, then I, I don't want it to be that way. But then Sid Callow was loved by Lester Young, right? Because he didn't have to think about what was going on back there. But on the other hand, there's always a contrast, right? Dewey told me, he goes, Matthew, I've been playing with Paul Motion for 40 years. I still can't figure out what in the hell is going on back there. <laughs> so you, we get inspired. You know, we want to inspire by having it feel comfortable, and we also want to inspire by being instigators. It's, it's, you know, there's no right or wrong way, and it's not, there's not a rubber stamp that we do with any of this. It's like always about the, the moment and the sound and the sh the, what the music is telling us. So again, when we have ways of... of, of, uh, of of, try, of playing things, then we're going to adapt to what the music is calling for. You know, sometimes we do want the rise cymbal to be very, very more stiff, right? If, if, it's, if it's Equinox, I'm not going to play the rise cymbal. I'm going to play more open. Ready? Okay. Shout chorus, a Betty Golson shout chorus, like. You know, I'm gonna play, I'm gonna shape it. So to me, the, the movements, the, the way I play the stroke, the way I move makes all the difference in the world. I can play something, I can play the time very narrow, I can play the time very wide. One, two, ready, go. Narrow. The dimensions of the time to me is one of the key things. So then that way we're not bored. If we're shaping the time all the time, we're not, you don't have those voices going, you're not doing anything. You know, I can do a lot with this right here, you know, and how I feel the symbol. So it's, you know, the older I get, the less, I mean, I try to, but if it calls for it, I mean, if, if, if somebody's, if, if Jeff, we'll, we'll play rooftop or something next, if Jeff's turning the color of that stool right, or I mean that table right there, I'm not gonna be back there going, like, if he's up there going, bah, bah, right? You know, which he can do. I have to match that energy. Let's play rooftop.
Yeah, there's all the stuff for me to do. Um, so, yeah, I mean, cats. If you, to me, if, if, we, if, we, if we work on the instrument and we listen to the music that we want to play and we play it with people, then we're going to find things, you know? So that's, I mean, it's easy to say, and, and, but, you, you, you know, it takes, um, you know, I, one of the great things about this is, is this journey too is, you know, like for example, I know we're, I know all of just, I knew just parents, I know all his brothers and sisters, vice versa, you know, like we know each other, Paul's family, you know, whole thing. And, and we, learn, we learn our journey, like one time we're in, in, in uh, California with Jeff and he, he grew up in Pacific Palisades and we're overlooking this cliff, you know, over the ocean. He goes, this is where I learned to play the blues. <laughs> but I mean, we all come from downstate, you know, Illinois. I mean, I didn't grow up in an urban environment for this music, but I got, I, it, it sounded in me, and I heard it, and I was like, this is something I wanted to pursue. So, you know, I, I, I have worked very, very hard, and I continue to work very hard at, like, just playing the music and, and serving the, the, the musical community and serving the music as much as I can. And I've been, again, I've been given a lot of great gifts, but I don't like to say good luck because I think it's really corny. What I like to tell people is you create your own good luck by the how you do what you do. You present yourself and you stay true with what you want to do and, you, and you're a nice person and all that stuff and, and, and opportunities will, uh, will, will, will come up for you. But a lot of times it's just all these down to these basics. You know, it's funny because I have these uh, young people today in their jury play a lot of time fields at very, very quiet volumes because I know that's going to be one of the things that's going to be called upon to make them even more valuable than everybody that plays everything at medium all the time. So they, played, they had to play a minute today of these time fields, all the double pianissimo. Just these kinds of things, to, 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 to ways to get you into the music and, and have you be more valuable. So, you know, and, and uh, we, we, we played a concert last weekend and, and, and I, I, this woman made a great statement at the end. 
She said there was a motto of some college, which was uh, leap before you look. Go for it. You know, like leap. Try things, you know. The, the, the answer, the, the, again, getting back to the answer is yes if it's legal. You know, try things, you know, and, and see what happens, you know. And in and, and, and the, and the words of Herbie Hancock, nobody remembers people that followed the rules. So, I mean, you know, we want to try things and do things all the time. Serve the music, be, be, you know, serve your fellow musicians, most important. And then, you know, you serve your creative spirits. This is really, it's really, really important. It's wake up every day. So lucky I get to go out and do something like this, you know. So uh, I'm blessed. So I'm also blessed to have great friends like Steve Maxwell, who, through Steve, I, I got hooked up with Johnny Craviato. I, I, I can't say enough, you know, and I got, I get, to, I played my drums on, because I never had to get to play them sometimes for concerts. So we played them on Sunday in Jersey, man. It was just so great to get to play these, and they just live, you know, they just breathe so beautiful. These two, too, it's great. So, you know, uh, but sound and touch, all that comes from, you've got to have that in your ears. So search out recordings, search out people that you like and their sounds, and, you know, go shopping, like try to, you know, there's sounds, you know, ride cymbal sounds, drum sounds, all that stuff. Have a barometer, have a, a benchmark of what you want your sounds to be, and then try to get those sounds and offer them. So that's what, what we all do. And then after a while, you'll start to find shapes and sounds and, and colors that work for you. And next thing you know, you're like doing all this different kinds of things. So uh, I'd like to also thank these great, my dear friends who are great, great musicians. Thank Eric Bender for coming out. Check him out online, man. He's great. Learn a lot of stuff. So, you know, we're always out there trying to search and, 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 and discover new things. So, uh, we have some CDs back there and some ornaments for sale, for 10 bucks each. And one last thing, uh, right before we end here, uh, real quick, does anyone else have any oh, yeah, other, other questions? Doesn't burning like question. Too, too elaborate, but anybody? Uh, anything? I covered them all, man. I covered you, them all. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> Dude, we, I was going to ask you about like time, some time stuff, but you were talking about that. So, you covered it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But any, any, just, just real quick. Yeah, know, anything. About to, about to end here. Cool, awesome, thanks. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Maxwell. From... I'm just gonna keep this on like for the rest of the tour. <laughs>